All right, hello class, and welcome to lecture 10, where we uh, sort of culminate our lectures 7 through 11 by solving the H infinity optimal output feedback problem. Output feedback. This is where we design a controller, a full order controller, so that it has internal dynamics, and which solves uh, the problem of optimal control in the H infinity sense from exogenous disturbances to regulated outputs using outputs from the, um, the, the, the plant to be controlled, which are not simply the concatenation of the internal states of that system. So I wouldn't say that there's a whole lot of new intellectual concepts presented in this lecture. Um, we are going, again, you're going to use a variable substitution, although we use several of them, actually. Um, we again use variable substitution. We again use duality. Um, but it's more complicated in this case, as we'll, we'll soon find out. Uh, so there's a, there's several parts to this lecture. It's not terribly long. Uh, again, it's more of like an application of what we've already learned, but with some, we have to introduce a few new tricks to, to get this thing to work out. Um, so there's several parts, right? Uh, the first is to, right, we had that, we're, we're optimizing this lower star interconnection. And uh, the first part is to, get this, do a variable substitution, which gets this, uh, substitu get, get this expression for the closed loop system, it makes it convex, right? So that's step one. Uh, so we have a convex expression for the closed loop system. Then the next question is duality. And duality is trickier in the optimal output feedback case. Um, and the reason is that if you remember, uh, we got an LMI for uh, stabilization or H infinity optimal full state feedback control. And we had an LMI for observer design. So we had two LMIs, and one of them, namely the controller design, used duality before we did a variable substitution, and the other did not. So the observer design LMI did not use the duality uh, in order to get us to a point where we could use variable substitution. Uh, so we didn't actually cover the LMI for optimal observer design. Uh, I suppose I could, I should have signed that for homework or something like that. It's also in the book. Uh, it seemed kind of repetitive since we're doing optimal output feedback, and so it sort of makes it instantly obsolete. Uh, maybe we should have, but we didn't. In any case, so we need duality for the controller design, but we don't want it for the observer design. And so that poses a bit of a problem, and then how do we uh, how do we dualize the controller part of the optimization problem without dualizing the observer part of the optimization problem? And that's going to be very tricky. And so there's uh, so, some mathematical tricks we do to use to do that. And then we, once we've done that, we have to do a variable substitution. And again, we're going to we have to somehow do a variable substitution. Di separately on the controller part and on the observer part, so because one is it was com coming from is is primal and one is dual, and so that's also going to be tricky. <clears throat> uh, so, but once we've once we've done that it, again, the the concepts are relatively straightforward, right? Convexify, dualize, variable substitution, and then we get our LMI. Um, so conceptually, the, this, uh, this lecture is not terribly difficult. But as we'll see, the, the mathematics, the algebra, does become somewhat 
cumbersome. So uh, bear with me as we as we go through it. Right, I'll break this into to two parts of the lecture. Right, part A, we'll talk about convexification. Part B, we'll talk about duality. And if we have a part C, we'll talk about the LMIs and reconstructing the controller. I'm not sure actually we're going to have a C, but we'll see. <clears throat> right. So here we are, back to our uh, our wonderful LFT. Uh, back to our feedback interconnection, where you've designed your P, or you've put it in the form of a either a four system representation or a nine matrix representation. And uh, we've parameterized our controller using AK, BK, CK, and DK force matrix. Again, we are not going to deal with the transfer function or system representation. We're going to use the, mate, the, the state space representation of this system. So we'll be focusing on these, uh, the interconnection of those two subsystems. Now, in, of course, the full state feedback case, we, uh, we just set that equal to identity, and these were zero. But we're not going to do that in the full state feedback because we want our sensor measurements to be the inputs to our controller. And if we do that, we need a full order controller. We can't do static output feedback. So we need these four, all we need these three matrices, whereas before we only had one matrix for state feedback. <clears throat> now, as we went over in the previous lecture, in lecture eight, uh, the interconnection of these two subsystems is rather complicated. And so that's on the next slide. So in this system level, we, we talked about it from the, as the LFT. Uh, if you apply that to the state space representation, uh, we, as we noted earlier, get this horrible nonlinear, non-convex expression for the four system closed loop representation. Four, uh, far, sorry, four matrix closed loop representation. Right, where we've got a matrix inverse here. Remember, Q is also defined in terms of a matrix inverse. We have CK multiplying DK multiplying BK. And so this whole thing is obviously not very convex. And so our first task uh, in part A of this lecture is to do a variable substitution or a se series of variable substitutions, I should say, which uh, allow us to express this four system closed loop representation in a way which is affine in our decision variables, our decision variables now being a, k, b, k, c, k, and d, k. Right. <clears throat> so how are we going to do that? So first of all, we'll simplify those inverses, right? These inverses here. Simplify those bits. Uh, we've already done the simplified the inverses over here, uh, so Q already appears. And now we'll just continue that process by applying the matrix inversion level. We get that Q here showing up, and so we just continue that process of uh, <clears throat> expanding out those uh, those matrix inverses. So uh, in particular, here's the matrix, here's its, uh, its inverse, right, expressed in terms of Q. Uh, we now apply that to just substitute in for these, uh, these two inverses here, uh, one in AK and one, or the closed loop A and one in the closed loop C. Right, so we have ACL, meaning this is the, uh, these are the, the system matrices of the system in closed loop. So those are those those big A's, A's from the previous slide. Um, so this is ACL, this is CCL, DCL, and BCL. Right. So our closed loop system representation, ACL, BCL, CCL, and DCL for closed loop, obvious. 
So uh, we plug in for that, uh, that matrix there, matrix inversion. We multiply through by these BKs and CKs, and we get uh, an expression for the closed loop A matrix. We do the same for C, plug in the inverse, uh, multiply these matrices out, and we get a closed loop expression for CL. Right. Notice that, uh, so of course, the dimensions of CL, right? So we have a closed loop system here, ACL, BCL, CCL, CCL, DCL, right? The, uh, the size of these matrices, right? Uh, so this will correspond to uh, W, this corresponds to Z, and the size of ACL corresponds to the size of the aggregate state, so the state of the system, the, the plant, and the state of the controller. Right. So uh, it has twice as many uh, uh, states as, uh, as the original system. Now, we assume, of course, that our X, our, our, our controller, has the same, num same dimension as the plant uh, it's trying to control. So these, uh, that's a full order controller. That's what we call a full order controller. So if uh, the states for the, uh, the, the plant are in Rn, uh, we assume that the states for the uh, controller are also in Rn. Okay. So that's, uh, so that, hence we get these aggregate uh, system rep, uh, state space representations, right? where uh, the, the number of states is doubled here. Yeah. So now we've got, uh, again, right, a horrible nonlinear, non-convex expression for uh, the closed loop system, ACL, BCL, CCL, and DCL. Right, in terms of our decision variables here, uh, Q, uh, AK, BK, CK, and DK. So obviously, uh, this is not satisfactory. We can't we can't work with this. Uh, it's not convex in any sense. And so our first step is to do a variable substitution, where the uh, the, the closed loop system is affine in the variables. <clears throat> now we didn't need to do this for the state feedback case. Remember the state feedback case. In, uh, in the state feedback case, we got, uh, without any variable substitutions, that our closed loop systems were A plus B2K, or uh, I guess we're using a DK here, so we should do that, DK, uh, B1, uh, <coughs> C, um, um, Uh, C, uh, C1 plus uh, D12 DK and uh, D2 do D11. So sorry, my memory is uh, takes a little has a little lag time there. Um, <clears throat> so just in a, in the state feedback case, just by uh, you know the simplifications we made that AK, BK, and CK are zero and uh, C2 is the identity, and D21 and D22 are zero, uh, we got something which is affine <clears throat> in, the, in the variable. In the <clears throat> full, uh, the output feedback case, of course, uh, it's not, we don't get that, right? We, we get something which is, has our original variables and it's, it's not affine. And so our first task then is to define a new set of variables <clears throat> and the, the conversion between the, the new set and the old set has to be invertible. That's the most important part, um, uh, which is affine in the, uh, in the new variables. <clears throat> so how are we gonna choose our new variables? Right? Uh, so, well, let's look at this. Uh, look at this expression here and figure out what we're gonna have to do, right? Well, the most obvious source of nonlinearity are these terms, dkq, dkq, they appear several times, dkq, uh, 
DKQ, DKQ, DKQ. Right, so that appears a lot. Uh, so our first variable substitution is going to be, we're going to create a new variable, DK2, which is just DKQ. Right, so that's, uh, that's going to allow us to get rid of all of these, uh, the ones I've just highlighted. Well, um, actually, we're not going to do that. We're not going to apply it here for reasons I'll talk about in a second. Um, <clears throat> But it, uh, it allows us to, to right away uh, say, right, that is DK2. Uh, this one's DK2. Uh, this one's DK2. And uh, this one is DK2. All right, so those are, are going to go away and become affine in the, in the new variables. <clears throat> now, I didn't highlight here because this, this term is more problematic. Because even if we do that variable substitution, Right, you're still multiplying by CK. So actually, we're not going to apply that, uh, that variable uh, transformation here. We're going to hold off on a second there. Right. Uh, so uh, so we, we apply that DK2 substitution in four places. Right? And uh, that gets rid of several of the nonlinearities. Uh, so now, ne now what? What's left over? OK, so um, obviously, uh, let's, let's change color here. Uh, what's remaining? Well, there's this bit here, um, here, that's remaining. Um, what else is remaining? Oh, there it appears a bit again there. Uh, there's a, here I'll change color there, uh, make that uh, green, right? Uh, what else do we got? Uh, well, we got this term which multiplies, that's bilinear, right? So we'll, multiply, we'll highlight that. Uh, the same term appears here. Uh, and then, of course, we have uh, we have this uh, this bit here, right? So this uh, this uh, this this term is not only multiplying q but also b k and c k, right? So we have this other um, term over here. Uh, here I'll, I'll hold off on giving that its own color right now. <clears throat> so all right. So which uh, what's our next variable substitution? Well, the green ones look good. Um, let's uh, let's create a new variable which includes all of the uh, terms which are nonlinear in those in those variables. So we'll create a new variable ck2, which gets rid of all of these pieces here. That's uh, ck2, and that's ck2. All right. So now it's uh, this is affine in uh, ck2, affine in dk2, DC, dk2, dk2, dk2. All right. Right, so what's left over? Okay, just these three terms here, right? Here, here, and here. All right, so okay, what's next? Um, well, BKQ uh, is, is, is a pretty good choice, right? Because that appear, that's going to get rid of this nonlinearity in that one, right? So that's BK2. This one's BK2. Uh, and I don't do the substitution here because, right, it still has a CK multiplying it by. So now we have only have one, uh, one term left. And I'll give it a new color. Um, let's not, what haven't we chosen? Let's choose um, pink or blue. All right, so we only have one term left here, uh, which is this bit here. And uh, there's no real way of getting around this term because it has like essentially all the variables, original variables in it. And so we'll just uh, make a new variable which includes all of those pieces. Right. And we'll call that AK2. Right. So <clears throat> we've defined four new variables which eliminate the nonlinearities in all of our original variables and our original variables no longer appear anywhere in the original expression. So old variables don't appear in the new expression. And the new expression is affine in the new variables. So two important points uh, in order for this variable substitution to work. Uh, now there's a, there's a question, of course, right? Uh, 
So if I solve my optimal control problem in these new variables, right, and I find values for AK2, BK2, CK2, and DK2, right, can I then reconstruct AK, BK, CK, and DK such that these, uh, these equalities hold? So the problem is not entirely hopeless, hopeless, right? It's plausible that you could do that, um, even though, right, obviously I didn't, it didn't seem like I chose them for that purpose. Uh, and the reason is, of course, because I've got the same number of variables in my new variables as I did in my old variables, right? So I have four old variables, four new variables, and I have one equation for each, right? For, uh, so four unknowns, let's say, which are our original variables, a, k, b, k, c, k, d, k, and I have four equations, which they have to satisfy. So there's hope, right? It might be invertible. Uh, is it though? Well, that's, that's, that's what we'll address on the original question. So the question is, Given AK2, BK2, CK2, and DK2, can I find AK, BK, CK, and DK such that these equalities are, are satisfied? If I can, right, then I can now do optimization in these new variables. Right? And I can find, uh, try and optimize the H infinity norm of this closed loop system. Right. So, uh, all right. So first of all, let's let's look at look at look at our our, our thing here and see what we've got. Right. Well, okay. Uh, it's it's affine in our new variables. Uh, I believe uh, I color coded them this way. Um, not absolutely sure I colored the code in that way. And what was the other one? I think it was green. Right. So affine in my new variables. So that's that that's positive. Um, so the question then becomes invertibility. Can I invert this variable substitution? So to solve that problem, um, let's do it in a somewhat counterintuitive order. So we'll start with assuming we have AK2, BK2, CK2, and DK2. Let's reconstruct AK, BK, CK, and DK. So <clears throat> how are we going to do this? So let's like start with the simpler ones, right? So in particular, uh, this was the equation number four, right? So that was uh, this variable. And uh, we start with that one because uh, it only involves dk and dk2. Right? So if this inversion is going to work, Obviously, I need to be able to start with dk2 because it only involves dk, right? So let's look at this expression. Well, from well-posedness, we know this is invertible. All right. So let's start by multiplying both sides of this equation by the whole equation by i minus d22 dk. Multiply the whole thing through. The inverse disappears, right? So we just get dk. And then uh, on the other side, we get dk uh, two minus, uh, sorry, times this i minus d22k, right? So we have to get this expression by multiplying through. So, okay, 
uh, what do we, what's the problem? All right, so remember, we need to uh, solve for, given dk2, we need to solve for dk. Well, if we look at this, right, uh, this gives us an expression for uh, dk in terms of dk2, except that we still got that dk here showing up, right? So that's a problem. So what are we going to do about that? Well, we'll take this whole term here and move it to the left-hand side, right? And so then we get identity plus dk2 d22, identity plus dk2 d2, times dk equals dk2. And though, so then to solve for dk in terms of dk2, uh, well, we know what dk2 is, so we can just, we know what this matrix is, so we can just invert that matrix, and so then that gives us an expression for dk. Right? And so we now have an expression for dk in terms of dk2, uh, where we have a matrix inverse right here. Now, of course, there's this question of whether this is invertible or not. Um, uh, ideally, right, if uh, D22 was zero, right, if you didn't have a sensor and an actuator co-located, D22 would be zero. And then obviously identity is invertible. However, if D22 is not zero, uh, potentially we could have a problem. Right, and it's going to be the same problem we had with well-posedness, right? It's the same idea. Uh, however, uh, we have no way of, uh, of restricting dk to such that this is invertible. So we basically just, we have to hope for the best. Right, so not entirely satisfactory, but in practice, d22 is usually zero, and so this is not usually a problem. So, okay, we've, so we now have uh, given dk2, we've been able to reconstruct dk. All right, so let's now move on to uh, the next bit. Uh, specifically, we're going to look at ck. Now, we did dk2 first because uh, ck2 is defined in terms of both uh, ck, the original, uh, the, the one we're looking for, that's what we want, and uh, dk, which fortunately now we've already found. So if we had tried to do this one first, it would be hard because we didn't have dk, right? So dk is sort of the one that appears most often, so we solved for it first. Now, how are we going to, uh, how are we going to approach this, uh, this problem? Well, first of all, we look at the expression for ck2. Right? That was, uh, I think, variable substitution green. Uh, and this was, uh, this was Q. This is Q here. Okay. So, uh, okay, what are we going to do? Um, well, okay, let's, let's, let's look at this. Um, so this is actually the, uh, the trickiest part of this, uh, this variable inversion, right? Because it requires us to use a trick uh, that we, uh, that you may not be familiar with. And that trick is an identity for matrix inversion. So the inverse of uh, identity minus QM inverse is I plus Q uh, minus MQ inverse times M. So obviously if M and Q in, are invertible, right, we can just bring the M inside the inverse and, and the Q inside the inverse and we're done. Uh, but in general, for our systems, Q and M are not invertible. So why is this, uh, this identity hold? Um, well, Again, it's, it's not obvious, but it's easy to prove, right? So if I, for example, I can prove this identity just by multiplying I minus Q uh, M on both sides. Uh, let's say, let's multiply it on the, on the left, for example. So if we're multiplying on the left, right, we can verify this identity uh, by showing that this whole thing is I, right? So if I minus Q M times whatever this is, is identity, then obviously this is equal to the inverse of I minus QM. Uh, so how do we show that? Well, we can just uh, multiply it, uh, I minus QM times this matrix here, 
and we get, well, I minus QM first gets multiplied by identity, so we have an I minus QM there. Uh, then I minus QM gets multiplied by this term. Uh, so there's two parts to this. Uh, first is the identity times this bit, so we'll just write that in, plus Q I minus M Q inverse M. And then there's the QM, or minus QM, times this bit here. So minus QM times this bit here. And we get I m minus QM, and then the whole thing, Q I minus M Q inverse M. Uh, and then this still looks fairly horrible, uh, but we can simplify it uh, by uh, factoring out this term on the right. So it's I minus QM, that stays the same. And then factoring out the terms on the right, plus uh, everything multiplying by, make sure I'm, yep, okay, uh, I minus MQ inverse M. So what multiplies that? Well, here it's Q, and here it's minus, uh, uh, so actually, so Q, it's minus uh, QMQ. And of course, we can uh, pull uh, Q out of, the, on the, out of the left of this. Uh, so this is equal to QI minus MQ. Oh, minus there. So uh, let's, uh, let's just do that simplification there. Right, And so the I minus MQ times I minus MQ obviously cancel. And so we get I minus QM plus just Q times M. And so that minus cancels the plus and we just get the identity. Right, so proven, at least on the left. And you can repeat the process on the right as well. So this shows that uh, this is, in fact, a left inverse. Uh, you can repeat the process to show it's the right inverse as well. Okay. So let's, uh, let's apply this now to uh, this expression here, i plus uh, dkq, right? This is i plus dkq22, right? That's the expression here. Uh, so let's apply it, right, uh, expand out uh, the Q. And uh, now here we're making uh, Q equal to D22 and M equal to DK, applying the identity. And we get that this is nothing more than I minus Q M inverse. Okay. So we can simplify now the expression for CK as just equal to I minus DK D22 inverse times CK. So remember what the goal is, we want to find CK given CK2. And so it's obvious what we have to do now. We just multiply the whole thing on the left and the, on the left by I minus D2, or DK D22. So we do that, right? These two terms cancel out. And then we have the term multiplying uh, CK2 there, uh, and then CK appears by itself, and so that's what we want. So we, we've already found this from the previous slide, and we know this because it's our variable, our, our new variable. And so we can now extract or recover our original variable CK, right? by just applying this formula. So we can invert equation three as well. We can re re invert the, the green equation as well. So we've now uh, recovered two of our variables by solving two equations. Uh, and now we have two variables left and two equations left. Right. So let's go to the next step. So obviously the next step uh, is, uh, is the variable bk2, remember was uh, bk times q. And so obviously uh, if we know what bk2 is, we know how to recover bk, we just multiply it through by q inverse. So we just multiply this whole thing by q inverse and we get an expression for bk 
just as b uh, k2 times q inverse. Uh, what is q inverse, right? Well, remember what q was. q was i minus d2 to dk inverse. And so the inverse of an inverse is just the matrix itself. And so we have that, uh, well, I think what color was this thing? That was uh, yellow. Right. So we now have an expression for bk in terms of dk and bk2. So this is known from uh, the first, first inversion. And this is the one we found from our optimization problem. And so given uh, dk2 and bk2, we can recover the variable bk. So the last expression, uh, remember, was ak2 equals ak plus bk uh, i minus d2 to d, uh, dk inverse d2 to ck. Right, that was in the final expression. I forget what color it was. Uh, blue, I think I made it blue. So we had that last one. Uh, but fortunately, even though it's horribly uh, nonlinear, it involves all four variables, uh, we've already solved for the other three. So we already solved for uh, ck, we solved for dk, and we solved for B dk, a uh, bk. So all of these are already known. And so uh, we can find and uh, just uh, move this whole expression over to the left-hand side just by negative um, subtraction. And we find an expression for uh, AK. In terms of AK2, uh, which we found through our optimization problem, and BK, CK, and DK, which we've recovered uh, from our, uh, our previous two uh, expressions, the three expressions. So thus, we can give an AK2, BK2, CK2, and DK2, and we can recover all four of the original variables by solving these equations in order, right? And that's important that we do it in order, right? One, uh, actually, the order of these two doesn't matter too much. Two, three, so we could swap those if we like. And then, uh, most importantly, we do AK last, right? So. Uh, we have to do dk first, then bk, ck, and then ak. Uh, if we do those in order, however, given AK, B, ak2, bk2, and ck2, and dk2, we can recover our original variables. Um, and this shows that the optimization problem uh, can be expressed in the new variables ak2, bk2, and ck2, and dk2 without any uh, loss of generality. And uh, we can, given that solution, AK2, BK2, DK2, and CK2, we can recover the controller. Notice that these variables, AK2, BK2, CK2, and DK2, are not the controller for any particular system. They're just dummy variables, which we, we then use later. They're not really dummy variables, but they're variables that are, don't represent any controller whatsoever. They're just uh, mathematical conveniences. Right. So now uh, we've got uh, an expression for our closed loop system in terms of uh, four variables, AK2, BK2, CK2, and DK2. I think I'm getting the color coding right. Right. Uh, so we have an, uh, an expression for the closed loop uh, system, state space representation, which is affine in our four decision variables. So this problem should be uh, convexifiable, right? Because uh, norms are convex, uh, maybe not, well, okay. Norms are convex-ish, uh, depending on how you parameterize things. Uh, and so in principle, this should be convexifiable. Right. If we like, we can actually construct a, a single representation right, um, of just the, now this is not, not the state space form, right? This is not the system. This is an actual matrix. Right. 
right? So we can express the actual system matrices uh, in terms of in an affine form. Affine meaning uh, linear, it has a linear term, and it has a term which, uh, even if the variables are zero, is not zero. Right? So uh, we've got uh, this uh, a naught term or the system, uh, the, the nominal term. And then we have the effect of our four new variables, which appears here. Now, this form is not as convenient, of course, as uh, what we had for uh, state feedback, right? Where we had A plus um, B uh, to F, uh, C1 plus D to uh, 1 to F, and then uh, B1, D11, right? This, in this controller synthesis states full state feedback. We had, uh, we were also affine in our variables, but we didn't have anything multiplying on the right. Whereas now, these are our variables, so we're affine in our variables, but we have something on the right and we have something on the left. This is going to complicate our variable, our duality and variable substitution trick, right? right. And uh, here are just uh, individual systems, right? You see something on the left, something on the right, 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 right? And those things are not just the identity; they're so they're they're, they're system matrices. And so this is going to make our variable substitution problem much harder. Uh, in particular, our duality problem, make our duality problem much harder. Uh, if you look at this more carefully, though, you notice that there's a lot of identities showing up here, right? A lot of identities showing up here. So the problem is not going to be completely hopeless. We're going to do uh, a half dual transformation on these, on these system matrices. Now that's hand waving, right? Half dual, right? What is a half dual? It's dual or it's not dual, right? You're not in between. There's no shades of gray. Um, we will rigorously define that, uh, but to do so requires some ancillary results, which uh, are are rather complicated, and hence we're going to focus on that in part B of this lecture. And so at this point, I'll allow everyone to take a break and we'll come back and cover part B shortly.